Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the third uh, seminar of our series on econ the economics of platforms. And today we'll have Renato present a paper on regulating platform fees under price parity. Uh, just a reminder, uh, this is the, uh, the session is being recorded and we'll go officially for one hour. So depending on where you are, it's either 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. or 2 to 3 p.m. or whatever it is. And uh, after one, so the official seminar is over after one hour, but people can stay after one hour if they want to ask questions, you know, for more clarifications. And I think we'll stop the recording after an hour. And also a reminder, uh, Renato will speak for about 40 minutes, for, so for 40 minutes, and he'll pause to take any clarification questions. And we prefer to keep the, Q, the more substantive Q&A for the last 20 minutes. With that, Renato, all yours. Okay. So... <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to take part in this initiative. So this is, this is joint work with Andrea Mantovani uh, from Bologna. So the, the, uh, so the topic of this paper is how to regulate uh, information or, or matching platforms, which I'm sure uh, everybody agrees on that with me, are uh, increasingly important right, in, in today's economy. So I'm thinking about marketplaces such as Amazon's, or uh, OTAs, online travel agencies, or Uber, or you know, Open Table if you want to reserve restaurants, or student nannies if you need a nanny, and you name it, okay? So uh, in, in, in these platforms, uh, the agency model is often employed, and that means that platforms got a cut uh, uh, out of each transaction that happens uh, uh, in the platform, right? So this, of course, leaves room to a lot of opportunistic behavior, right? So, so, you know, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, buyers and sellers, they might, they might meet in, inside the platform and, and then engage in subsequent interactions uh, outside of the platform, therefore bypassing, bypassing the fee, right? Uh, depending on the context, this is not a concern. For instance, in Uber, the matches are transactional. Right? <coughs> Uh, if you want to reserve a restaurant, perhaps the only way to do it is through open table. The, the restaurant doesn't take reservations directly. But, but in other cases, it's a concern. Uh, if you think about Airbnb or the student nannies, whatever. Right? Uh, another, another important concern is what I call showrooming, what I call it, what the literature calls showrooming, which means that people gather information inside the platform. So the information provided by the platform is a public good. So people can just go there, learn what they have to learn and then they transact outside, also by passing uh, the platform fees, right? Uh, so uh, price party clauses, they aim at preventing the latter kind of opportunism. Uh, and these clauses, they stipulate that prices cannot be lower, cannot be lower elsewhere, right? Uh, uh, and that also applies to availability, conditions that cannot be better elsewhere, and, and so on and so forth. So, so that, that basically makes sure that consumers have, the, the, have no incentive to, to bypass the platform. Uh, let me, um, okay. Of course, there are opposing views on, on, on price parities, right? So platforms would like to claim that price parity is essential for the business, precisely to prevent this kind of opportunism. Um, but competition authorities, they see it differently they see it as a source or a reinforcer of, of platforms market power, right? So the, the, a common theory of harm uh, in, in these contexts is that uh, a price party clause reduces competition between platforms. Because if you think of a, a maverick uh, platform, an entrant that wants to enter the market by setting a lower, a lower fee, under a price party clause, uh, hotels won't be able to, to, to set lower prices in that platform if they still join the dominant platform, uh, which, which makes it entry and which makes competition in commissions something, uh, something uh, not, not, not very possible, right? So, so basically, uh, retail prices are not very elastic to, 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 to platform commissions, which also leads to a barrier to entry because, because entrant platforms have a, a, a hard time to, to, to make, to undercut commissions and, and, to, and to generate an impact on, on consumer behavior, on consumer choices. Um, and and uh, all of this also, also, also leads uh, to a common selling agent effect, 
in that price in, in that platforms can raise prices in a coordinated manner downstream right so by setting high commissions they can uniformly raise the price raise uh, the price set by sellers and 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 lead to you know much higher prices potential lower alpha and so on so so these concerns they led to a lot of scrutiny uh, by by especially uh, EU competition authorities right so in this table I summarize uh, uh, some of the recent developments. So, so starting in, in April 2015, the French, the Italian, and the Swedish uh, competition authorities, they, 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 they made Booking.com commit to switch from a wide press party clause where prices cannot be lower anywhere, anywhere right, in comparison to the platform, to a narrow one where prices could be lower in other platforms but not in the direct sales channel. Right? Uh, so, so this commitment took, to, took, came into effect in July 2015, but uh, uh, one month later in August, uh, uh, the French promulgated the Macron law, which prohibited PPCs altogether, right? Uh, and the Italians, the, the Germans, the Austrians, they, they, they went on a similar path uh, just after. <clears throat> the Italians as well in, in August 2017 and so on. So, uh, um, uh, that, that, that's, that, that pertains to OTAs, right, to online travel agencies. When it comes to marketplaces, I think about Amazon's marketplace, Price Party has been banned in the UK, and it has been very recently, this year, in fact, removed voluntarily in, in the US. Okay? So, so, uh, uh, so, so Price Party ha ha have been, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, deemed illegal or, or have been voluntarily remove it so they, they are no longer part of, in most cases, of the legal ladder that binds sellers on the platform. But, but it's not very clear that, that, that these measures produce tangible results, right? Uh, uh, for one, uh, sellers might still practice the, plat the, the, the price party to be in good terms with the platform, right? For, being, for fear of being downlisted, okay? So it's a conduct thing. Okay? Even if price parity is not in the contract, you don't want to be seen by the platform as someone that is sabotaging the business because you're going to be downlisted. Okay? Uh, there are also loopholes. So, so in France, uh, the Macron law stipulates that uh, um, price parties cannot be imposed, but they can be voluntarily accepted. So, 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 so uh, in, in this respect, there has been a lot of, uh, let's, call, let's call it preferred partner programs, wh whereby a hotel uh, accepts voluntarily to, to practice price parity and in exchange it's top listed, it becomes kind of a prime deal, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, it's also a concern that uh, many of the hotels, especially, especially the non-chain ones, they are quite unsophisticated in the pricing. So they have a scarce propensity to price differentiate and many of them they have limited awareness of these policy changes. Uh, and and they, there's plenty of evidence that, uh, they, that, that I think are explained by all these factors. So the European Commission Network in 2017 documented only minor changes in the commission fees following uh, major decisions that were still very high. So in the case of OTAs, they are close to on average to 20%. Uh, Hanold and co-authors, uh, they, they, they found evidence of, of the downlisting, they call it dimming. Uh, but, uh, whereby the, the OTAs penalize hotels that charge lower prices with, with worse rankings. Okay? Uh, Mantovani and co-authors, they, they also find a limited price effect on the short and medium run after the, the elimination of OTAs. They conduct a study where uh, comparing uh, uh, Corsica uh, with Sicily and, 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 and some Spanish islands where, where they manage to, 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 to control for changes in legislation keeping constant, let's say, the, the environment, right? Because these places are, uh, one can argue, they are somewhat similar. Uh, Andes and co-authors also find a limited price reduction on the direct sales channel following, following the removal of these price parties. So, so in a sense, the, the, our take uh, might be controversial, but our take is that the, the, the policy and academic debate has been centered on whether one should uphold reform, for instance, moving from a wide to a narrow price parity, or ban price parity altogether, and yet little consensus has emerged, both in terms of the effects of these policies, as well as in terms of whether this is theoretically desirable. Well, you know, whether when you do the economic theory, you do the step back, 
whether this is something that we actually want to do. And I'll talk about it in the next slide. So in, in this paper, we, we, we make kind of a first observation, which is, which is somewhat obvious. In, the, in there, we, we see the parallel with the payment industry, where, where the, there is a price parity clause, which is, which is called the no surcharge charge rule, which prevents merchants from price discriminating according to the payment method. So if you are a merchant and you, you are making a sale, if, if you accept a max, you cannot price discriminate. You cannot charge more for the guy that's, that's buying with an American Express, even if the merchant commission is 3%, even if it's super high, you know? So that's the no surcharge charge rule. And, and, and also in the payment industry, there are claims that no surcharge charge rules, they give too much market power to the card networks. And countries uh, adopted different strategies to deal with that. So, so the UK, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Australia, for almost 20 years, they, they lifted the no surcharge charge rule, allowing uh, merchants to price discriminate according to the payment method. Whereas other jurisdictions, such as the US or, or in Europe, uh, uh, the European Commission, they regulate the interchange fee. The interchange fee, you should think about it as something very close to the merchant, the merchant commission, okay? So it's very close to regulating the merchant commission, let me say. So, in, in, and in fact, in a policy brief in 2013, the European Commission suggested that allowing surcharging for cards, which fee is not, is, is not subject to regulation, uh, uh, should, 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 should be okay, you know? So, so, so the, the, there is the, the implicit idea that the competition policy alternative, which is banning this clause, and the regulation alter, uh, alternative, which is regulating commissions, that these two, these two are substitutes, okay? You can do one uh, or, or the other. Uh, so, so in a sense, we kind of leverage on this, on this parallel to, to, to develop uh, a theory of how one should regulate platform fees under price parity. So we're kind of taking the stance that in light of the empirical evidence, banning price parity can be done legally, but not de facto. De facto is, a, is, a, is, a, is, an, ambitious, is an ambitious thing to do. Uh, uh, the effects of banning price parity is small. So let's consider a world where, where uh, uh, price parity is still there, or it's de facto uh, difficult to ban, and let's think about how to regulate commissions directly. Uh, so we develop a theory in this direction. We derive an optimal cap. That is a formula on how to regulate, uh, on how to cap these commissions. And, and in particular, we relate this optimal cap regulation to competition policy alternatives, meaning relaxing or banning uh, uh, price parity. So, so as I'm, I'm not going to go for details now because that's just the introduction, but uh, uh, we articulate a theory of harm that's based on the contractual externalities that joining a platform generates to non-joining uh, firms. Uh, we propose a simple test to assess the platform contribution to producing consumer surplus. And we also compare the, 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 uh, uh, the optimal regulation with, for instance, banning price parity, if that was de facto possible. And we show that uh, banning price parity, if that was de facto possible, is akin to capping the platform fee at an efficiently low level, okay? So, so the, that's one of the, the takeaways from the analysis. So, so th there is a lot of related literature on this topic. So Edelman and Wright in 2015, they, they, they argue that platforms typically overinvest in the provision of non-pecuniary benefits, benefits, which leads to higher prices, lower welfare, and, and, and so intermediation is, is welfare decreasing somehow, uh, under conditions, of course. Uh, Boyk and Kortz and Johnson, they are the first to articulate the theory of harm that I mentioned before in that price parity uh, leads to higher commissions, uh, prevent entry, and, and, and increase final prices. Um, Wang and Wright, they argue that uh, the narrow version of price parity, in fact, improves upon the wild one, uh, upon the, the wild one uh, uh, especially when, when uh, uh, platforms are not viable in the absence of price parity. So that would be a good compromise. Uh, a dissenting view is offered by Johansson and Verger uh, who argue that price parity makes firms more prone to the listing, which tightens the participation constraint and in fact decreases commissions. So as I said, e even from a theoretical standpoint, it's not, it's not entirely obvious that banning price parity is a, is a good idea. And, and empirically, the effects are also, are also kind of uh, uh, not, not, not very present, right? So, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> so, so that's why we explore 
uh, the, the regulatory uh, avenue. Okay, so, uh, so, so these are my bold claims. Uh, I, I'll substantiate my claims in what follows, but I should stop here to see if, if there are any questions about my bold claims. So there are no questions in the chat. So what I suggest if people have clarification questions as we go along, it's a good idea, either raise your hand or maybe write the question in the chat and then we can ask them to Renato as, uh, as he stops uh, at regular intervals. But I think there are no questions uh, up to now as far as I can tell, so you can go ahead. Okay, great. So, so yeah, so feel free to ask them, but, uh, but let, let me describe uh, the model. The model is, is quite simple. So there are N firms, which are indexed by J, okay? And there is a unit mass of consumers uh, uh, that have single unit demands. So, so if you think about, uh, about the hotel application, consumers only, only, they, 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 they only need one hotel, of course, right? So the, the consumer's gross utility from J's product is the sum of two terms, okay? One is a vertical component, which is like the number of stars in a hotel, okay? A, a level of quality. And there is a match specific component, okay? So you should think of this match specific component as having to do with the location of the hotel, the facilities, whatever, you know, that, that's specific to the consumer. And each consumer has uh, preferences described by a profile of match values, which we call uh, Z, and this is drawn from some symmetric distribution G, okay? So, so this is ID across consumers, but, but the, the match values can be correlated uh, 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 for a given consumer, okay? Uh, uh, so so e each firm faces a constant marginal cost CJ and sets a price PJ, okay? So this is a, a, a standard discrete choice model. In a sense. So the, the key idea that we explore here has to do with consumer information, okay? With the impact of platforms on, on consumer information. So we say that the firm J belongs to the consideration set of a consumer if this consumer observes the pair uh, of gross utility and price, okay? And consumers can only transact with firms they are aware of, that is, that belong uh, uh, to, to their consideration sets, okay? So if a consumer doesn't buy from any firm, it gets zero, okay? But it has to choose something from, 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 from the consideration set that he knows. So, uh, uh, and, 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 and crucially, consumers are heterogeneous on these consideration sets, okay? So, uh, uh, so think about coming to Toulouse, okay? So I believe that many of you know the Hotel de Brienne, you might know Albert Premier, and you know, well, the EBs, who knows? Uh, so, so people are, you know, uh, so some people know these hotels, others uh, that come to visit their bus might know others, I know others. And, 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 and so on and so forth, okay? So consumers have heterogeneous information about what's in the market, okay? And the way that we formally describe this heterogeneity of information is through a new friend that we call a consideration profile, which is something that maps a subset of firms to a subset of consumers that knows precisely that set of firms. That's a consideration profile, okay? So that's this, this friend here. Uh, and, and uh, it, 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 this allows us to, to express some, uh, a concept that's crucial for the analysis, and I'm going to come back to it quite often, which is what I call the firm's potential demand. So that's the set of all consumers that know that firm, okay, under that consideration profile. So it's the union of, of, uh, 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 <clears throat> of all subsets of consumers that have that firm in, in their consideration set, okay? So that, that describes the potential demand of a firm. So in most cases, we want to have a tractable model. So we're going to assume that these consideration profiles are symmetric in the sense that all consumers possess consideration sets of the same size uh, and all firms have equally sized potential demands, okay? So, so, uh, so information is symmetrically distributed in a way, okay? To make, things, to make things simple. So this implies that the potential demands, they are precisely the, 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 the size of consumers consideration sets divided by the total number of firms. This should be intuitive. If consumers know 20% of firms, and if the consideration profile is symmetric, firms have a 20% potential demand. Okay? That, that's right. It it's not a big deal. Okay. So what's the role of a platform in this world? Okay? So the, the, the obvious observation that we make is that platforms, they, they expand consumers' information. So in the, in the baseline model, there is a, a monopolistic platform. And before 
consulting the platform. Think about a consumer that needs a hotel in Toulouse and this guy hasn't gone to booking.com yet. Okay? So the information that this guy has is described by some consideration profile, sigma lower bar. Okay? That's what he knows absent booking.com, okay? before visiting book.com. So this captures all the information that can be obtained through advertising, travel shopping guides, friends recommendations, you know, previous experiences, whatever. So, so the, the way that we model the platform's contribution to, to information, it, we do it in a very stark and simple manner. So we assume that all firms listed in the platform are added to the consideration sets of every consumer. Okay? So there is an implicit assumption that visiting the platform is costless and that once you visit the platform, you seamlessly uh, learn everybody that is there. Okay? So, I mean, the idea is that platforms, they have uh, 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 quite efficient search tools. You can sort hotels the way you want. You, 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 you have many ways to search. So, so kind of the implicit assumptions that consumers, they learn everything they have to learn very fast. Okay? And if all firms join the platform, that means that consumers, they, 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 they seamlessly learn everything that's available in the market. And that's described by this information, this consideration profile, Sigma upper bar. So, which has the highest reach, so that is, all consumers know everything, okay? Uh, so, so in this way of modeling uh, uh, makes it, make, makes it, makes something evident that I would like to, to emphasize here, which is, which is the fact that firms that join the platform, they expose non-joining firms to an externality. So, that's an externality of non-participants, okay? So, so to, 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 to understand this idea, suppose that all firms join the platform, except for some firm J, okay? So what's gonna be the consideration profile that describes information in this economy? It's gonna be something that I call Sigma minus J, and, and it has two features. One is that all consumers that considered firm J, now they consider all other firms. But those consumers who did not consider firm J, now they consider all firms other than J, because they learned everything that's in the platform, right? So what this means is the following. Uh, suppose that I'm the firm that doesn't join, okay? So if I don't join, I'm going to enjoy the same potential demand that I had before. Everybody that knew me, they still know me, fine. But the, the point is that now they know many other firms, okay? So my potential demand, if I don't join, is the same that I had uh, uh, absent the platform. But those guys that, that populate my potential demand, they have much more information. So my potential demand is much more contestable. So the fact that firms join the platform imposes an externality on non-participating firms by means of the fact that the potential demands are much more contestable. There is much more competition for my potential demand. Okay? So I'm going to come back to this idea uh, in a second. So. so let me just finish the description of the model by describing contracting. Right? So price parity is in place, and uh, the platform is going to offer each firm J uh, privately a FFJ. The, the private contracting is not essential. Our results they hold with public contracting as well, just doing private contracting because somehow I found it simple. Uh, the, the platform is, is profit maximizing and uh, we assume that if all firms join, uh, all, all, if a firm join, all of its sales happen through the platform because it's somehow more convenient and a firm uh, enjoys a, a convenience benefit B if the transaction happens within the platform because the firm doesn't need to process the transaction, process the payment and so on. So there is a convenience benefit that has nothing to do with the informational benefits, just convenience. Okay? And, and so to summarize what I just said, the timing is as follows. The platform privately offers each, each firm a fee FJ, firms simultaneously set prices and decide whether to join the platform. And then consumers are gonna buy from some firm they are aware of of course, as a function of who joined the platform, okay? So the solution concept is the usual one, perfect Bayesian equilibrium with passive beliefs for short equilibrium. And, and uh, in order to get some tractability, I'm gonna impose some symmetry assumption that basically means that the gains from trade are constant across firms. So, so this means that the delta, which I define as the gains from trade, Vj minus Cj, is, is invariant in J, meaning that uh, uh, hotels with more stars are more expensive. Uh, in, a, in a commensurate manner. 
You know? Renato, just one quick question uh, here. Sorry, uh, the, when you say firm set prices, is, are there two prices for each firm? One off the platform and on the platform, or only one price? No, no, we are assuming that there is price parity in the baseline model. So there is a single price. Right. And then you have a question from Jacques. Do consumers have to make a choice of joining a platform? No, they don't. We assume that if booking.com is there, everybody goes to booking.com as a first decision. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so so that, th these, are the, 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 that, these are the main elements of the model. I give some, some small preliminaries here. Okay? So well, of course we proceed by backward induction. I'm gonna be, 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 be fast on this. So the first thing we need to think about is how consumers choose among what they know from their consideration set, okay? So if a consumer knows a consideration set S, he's gonna look at all firms K that belong to that consideration set. He's gonna pick the best one. The best one is the one that maximizes the difference between the gross utility and the price, okay? So this is just a discrete choice. There's nothing special here. And uh, you can write the, the sales of each firm as a function of the distribution of match values, right? Just like in any uh, discrete choice model. So uh, here in this assumption, don't pay much attention to it. We, we find a way to describe demands in a very natural manner, and we impose an assumption on hazard rates that assures quasi-concavity. So all that I want you to retain is that quasi-concavity is good. Let's move on, okay? Uh, uh, so, so let me describe the pricing equilibrium in the last stage, okay? So I say that the pricing equilibrium is symmetric if firms have constant markups, okay? So, so in, a, in a symmetric equilibrium, prices increase one-to-one -one with the vertical quality of the firm, okay? So markups are constant. This is, this is for tractability. So, it, 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 so, so basically, if you take a consideration profile sigma, which is symmetric with rich N, then the, the, the symmetric price equilibrium will be such that prices are marginal cost plus a markup term, which you call lambda N. And that's, the, and that's a function of, of the reach of the consideration set that, that, that describes consumer information, okay? So this lemma is important because it, it synthetically describes price equilibrium in a different number of settings. For instance, if all firms join the platform and they face a symmetric fee F, then the symmetric fee F is understood as a marginal cost. And the equilibrium fee is CJ plus F plus lambda of N, big N, because all consumers, they know the whole thing, okay? So, so, so that, that's just a, 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 a let's say, a convenient way of describing pricing. And the special case of this model include Logit or the Spokes model. It's a generalization of Hoppe, right? Among others. Notice that this markup does not need to be decreasing in N, okay? Competition can increase markups, you know? Chen and Riordan have noticed that uh, some time ago. So, so th these are just preliminaries just to, to, to make the pricing clear, okay? Feel free to interrupt me if, if something is not unclear, if it's not clear. But, uh, but uh, that, that's just about the pricing. Okay, so if everybody is happy, I can, I can go to laissez-faire, okay? To, to, which means uh, what, what fees would, would prevail if, if there was no regulation whatsoever, okay? So that's the, that's the content. I think there is a, a question popping up, right? I, I... Andre, is there a question? No. There is indeed. Um, so is N a real number or an integ integer? integer? It's, a, it's an integer. Yeah, big N is an integer. It's a, it's a natural number. Uh, yeah, uh, right. Big N, I think it's a small N. Is there a small N? There is a small N. The small, the small N is, is basically, uh, it, 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 before consumers visit the platform, what do they know, you know? So it's also a natural number. It's, it's just, uh, you know, consumers know on average five firms. If they, if they join the platform, they know 20 firms, you know? That, that's right. Got it. Um, Okay, so, so now I, I'm under laissez-faire. There's no regulation. The platform is free to do whatever it does and price parity is in place, okay? So, so, so the, the claim of the proposition is that there exists a symmetric equilibrium where all firms join and, and the, 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 the equilibrium fee is the following. So, so it, it, the equilibrium fee makes firms indifferent between joining the platform or not joining the platform, okay? So in the left-hand side, this friend here, is the profit that firms obtain when they join the platform. So it's the markup when everybody, all consumers know all the firms divided by the sales share, which is one over N because the model is symmetric. So that's, that's the left-hand side. What's in the right-hand side? 
The right hand side is what the firm gains if it does not join. Everybody else is joining. I'm the one that doesn't join. So what happens to me? I have my potential demand, my pre-visit potential demand, the folks that know me uh, if, I'm, if I'm out of the platform, times the maximal profit per sale that I can make in this world. This profit per sale uh, is potentially higher than the one if I join the platform. Why is that? Because I'm facing lower marginal costs. I'm avoiding the commission. Okay? So that allows me to adjust my price by a friend that I call Delta P. To, to maximize this, 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 this profit per sale. So the equilibrium fee makes firms indifferent between the listing, which reduces the potential demand because I only have the guys that knew me before, but I'm competing with lower marginal costs. The other alternative is to remain in the platform, enjoy a super large potential demand, but I'm competing with no marginal cost advantage whatsoever. So just a, a small observation, this equilibrium is also an equilibrium if the platform is choosing a public fee, uniform fee, uniform public fee, okay? But, uh, but, but yeah. Uh, so so let, 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 me, let, let us look a little bit more into, into the pricing of a, of, a, of a firm that delists, okay? So, so the, the optimal price adjustment satisfies this first order condition. There is nothing special here. And, and the key is that this, the, 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 the optimal price adjustment will be a discount if the net fee, which is F star minus the convenience benefit, is positive. Okay? So the platform has always room to charge more than its convenience benefit, because if it charges precisely the convenience benefit, the optimal price adjustment is zero, and all firms have a dominant strategy to join, because the profit inside the platform will be larger than the profit uh, outside of the platform. That's what's written just here. So, so the, 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 the one small observation is that the platform will always set the price higher than the convenience benefit. In a sense, the, the, the major concern is that the platform will set a commission that will be much higher than even the informational benefit generates to, to the other market participants, which are consumers and firms. And the way to see this in a, in a, in a simple manner is, is, is to think about how equilibrium fees change, as we change uh, the, the, the size of consumers' consideration sets before they visit the platform, okay? So the information that consumers organically know, okay? Uh, so, so in this corollary, we show that the size of potential demand is a sufficient statistic to do comparative statics. So if the pre-visit consideration profile has a smaller potential demands, then the equilibrium fee will be larger. Okay, that's, that's precisely the content of, of the lemma. So firms will accept higher fees, the smaller their pre-visit potential demands are. And in particular, if you make the potential demands very small, you can make the equilibrium fee grow unbounded. Okay? So, so the, 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 all of this to say that if potential demands are small, the, the, the platform fee might well exceed the convenience and informational benefits that it generates to consumers and firms. So it's, it's the familiar insight that uh, intermediation can be well for decreasing. Okay. So what's the source of market power uh, for the platform? The, the source should be familiar. It's, it's, it's a contractual externality, right? In the parlance of, of Siegel, right? So, so it, it's the, the, the externality of non-participants that I described a, a moment ago. So listed firms, they render the potential demands of non-listed one more contestable because the consumers that belong to that potential demand, they know much more now. So there is a reduction in the outside option, which leaves room to high fees, okay? And that, that can actually lead to a reduction in welfare, okay? So, so in a sense, the, the problem that we identify is that the platform appropriates too much, too much of, of, the, of its informational benefits. It appropriates more than the informational benefits if it's not subject to regulation, okay? And something that I, I'll come back to in a second is that uh, uh, by the end, is that banning price parity is in fact prevents, if you could de facto ban, it, ban price parity, uh, uh, it would basically prevent the platform from appropriating any of the informational benefits that it generates. So we have two extremes. If you de facto ban price parity, the platform won't appropriate any informational benefits. As, as, as I'm gonna argue later, it, it's akin to capping the commission at the convenience benefit. If you let the platform do laissez faire, no regulation whatsoever, it might appropriate much more than the, the, than the informational benefits it generates. So the middle ground is, is, is what's achieved by 
capping commissions. Okay, so which is which is what I want to talk about now. Renato, just one quick question. Uh, if you can go back to the previous slide. Um, so actually, one more slide. So did you say that uh, F star, so the optimal fee can grow unbounded? That seems, I mean, I can understand why the platform can set a much higher fee than the, a higher fee than the informational value, uh -huh. but how is it possible that it grows unbounded? Yeah, I, I'm, being, I'm being precise here because we have to, I mean, we're always assuming that the market's fully covered. So it cannot really go unbounded because I have to change the right. at the same time. So unbounded is an exaggeration, but, but it can go large and we can cook up examples where it grows very large. Okay, yeah, it just goes beyond the informational value, but not precise. That, that's the point, yeah, I'm, I'm being precise, thanks. Okay, so, so let me talk about cap regulation. So in order to, uh, yeah, there is a question, I think, right? Uh, as long as, uh, so you have, uh, as long as all firms join the platform, the welfare is constant. Is that true? Uh, as long as all firms join the platform. Let, let me talk about welfare. I'm going to talk about welfare in a second. And then, okay. then we can. But I think that's just a baseline. So if all the firms join the platform, is welfare the same no matter yeah. what? It, it would be, yeah, yeah. Because especially if you're utilitarian, if, if price can solve. And then USC has a follow-up, I guess, on my question. Why does, um, why does the optimal fee go above the informational value? Maybe you can clarify that a bit. That, that's, that's precisely because of the externality among participants. Basically because uh, uh, when firms join, they are generating an externality on those that do not join because the potential demand of those do not join it becomes smaller because their potential demand is much more contestable. So the outside option goes very much down, right? And that's what the, this externality is what, is what provides platforms market power. So that's why the platform can charge more than the informational benefit generates computed from the perspective where the platform is not there, you know? So, yeah. so, so that's, that's what generates uh, market power. Um, okay, so Jacques actually had a follow-up on, uh, on the previous question. So it says, welfare must increase as there are more participants to the pl on the platform as there's better matching of consumers to firms. That, no, that precisely occurs, yeah. I understood okay. the previous welfare question. Welfare is not constant, so you can have... Uh, no, so, okay, so, right, fair enough, okay. But if you have all the firms on the platforms, then welfare is the same. Uh, if you have, can, can you say it again? If all the firms are on the platform, so this was the previous question, then the welfare is the same. Yes, yes. Okay, so, um, okay, so let, let, not, let me now talk about cap regulation. So in order to talk about regulation, we have to introduce an extensive margin uh, uh, that describes the platform's decision to operate, okay? So, so, so th this, this, this operational cost we describe it as K, it's private information of the platform, has some distribution, doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and this operational cost, it involves monitoring costs, making sure that hotels are respecting price parity, advertising, for instance, OTAs are the main clients of Google uh, sponsored links, you know? So there's a lot of, these platforms, they engage in a lot of advertising and, and there, there are a lot of expenses related to advertising, okay? So if the platform wants to operate in Toulouse, it has to spend a lot of money, okay? Uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, for instance, to be in Google. Uh, uh, so so the, the, the regulation that we consider here is a cap regulation, okay? So it's putting a max on the, on the platform's commission, okay? Uh, this cap is inconsequential if it's greater than uh, the, the, the equilibrium under laissez-faire. Uh, but, but this cap is gonna bind. It's less than the, the laissez-faire uh, platform's fee, in which case, because we are looking at an equilibrium where all firms join and there is a unit mass of consumers, the platform's revenue is going to be precisely uh, this FR, which is the minimum between the laissez-faire and the cap, okay? When the cap binds, of course. Renato, sorry, I just realized something. Just a quick reminder. So we're supposed to be, you're supposed to present for about 40 minutes. It's about 8.39. So I see. If, uh, again, like counting questions. Uh, I was hoping, can we go to like 8.45 or something like, uh, sorry, until 45 after? Do you think you can, you can make it? Yeah, 47, 47. 47, okay, fine. 47. Just, just, a, just a heads up. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. So, so the, our offer measure combines two terms, right? 
So, so in the paper we do we do things more generally, but here we are doing utilitarian welfare. So, so, so we count consumer, producer, and platforms profit uh, similarly. Uh, and, and in order to express welfare, we need to 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 I mean, anticipating what uh, Jacques was asking about, uh, we need to talk about the the the, the match benefits that the platform is generating. So, so I have to introduce this notation, which is another statistic, the one out of n. Okay because the distribution G is symmetric, it doesn't matter which coordinates you pick. So, so the platform's objective is then, uh, it consists of two terms. When, when the fee allows the platform to operate, uh, the, the welfare consists of the gains from trade, plus the expected match benefit, plus the convenience benefit, minus the operation cost. But there is a chance that the, the cap is too tight, the platform does not operate, in which case you just get the trade gains and the smaller uh, 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 match benefit, because consumers will be picking the best firm out of N hat, as opposed to out of N. Okay. So, so uh, when I describe consumers' information in the absence of a platform, I, here I'm making a counterfactual statement, okay? Because if booking.com was not there, consumers might go back to the travel guides or might just look at Google, perhaps, which is simple, okay? So, so if, if, if the, the specialized platform does not operate in a market, then consumers will, will, will arguably uh, search more because they don't have booking.com to go to, right? So, so the consideration profile that would prevail in this counterfactual is what I call sigma hat, and that's where the n hat uh, uh, appears. Uh, uh, so, so there is an implicit assumption that the time searching by consumers is similar with or without the platform, but that the platform because it's a specialized search engine, it's actually improving market information relative to general purpose alternatives, okay? So, so what's the optimal cap? The optimal cap is the sum of the convenience benefit and the informational benefit that the platform generates. So here's the convenience benefit, and here's the informational benefit generated by the platform, okay? So th this, this formula should be familiar because it's, it's in fact an expected externality rule. It's basically saying that the platform commission cannot be higher than the expected externality that's imposed on other market participants. Okay, so it's very much in the spirit of the pivot mechanism. And it's also similar to uh, the tourist test, except that there is the tourist test from payment cards, except that there is an informational benefit on top. Okay. Uh, so this is all nice and beautiful. Okay, I mean, this formula should not be very controversial, except that it's not, it's not, it's, it's not useful at all. Right? Uh, basically, because we cannot express these formulas in terms of observables, right? So what's the distribution of consumer taste? You know, I mean, who knows? Uh, uh, so, so in, in a sense, uh, the idea that we, that, that we do here is to employ approximation techniques based on extreme value theory to talk about the expansion in informational benefits, to express this expansion in informational benefits in terms of stuff that's easier to observe. Okay? So you should think of what, what, what we're doing here as an econometrician that has to do hypothesis testing. He has a sample. He doesn't know the, 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 you know, the, the probability uh, properties uh, of, of his statistic in a small sample. But he knows that you know, if the sample is large, he, he has an asymptotically normal distribution. And then he's going to make hypothesis testing, hoping, praying to God, that, that his, his, his small sample is close to the asymptotics, okay? So we're going to be doing a similar thing here. It's an approximation, has no economic content. It's just, it's just a, 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 an asymptotic approximation. So what we're going to do is that we're going to let the market grow large. We're going to make what consumers know grow large. And we're going to approximate the optimal cap formula in terms of observables, okay? And, and this, is, this is potentially helpful because uh, things are, are measurable. There are gonna be profits and, and markups and, and convenience benefits and, or measurable for surveys, for instance, consideration sets and, and so on. So, so here's the mathematical statement. Since I'm running out of time, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it. But, but the, the, the main statement is that under regularity conditions that are easily satisfied by, by most distributions that people use in applied work, uh, this left-hand side, which is the expansion in consumers' uh, information, information benefit, right, divided by firms' markup, us n hat and n grow large, 
while satisfying this formula, what this formula is, potential demands remain constant, okay? So potential demand is 20%, but the market's large. So this, this 20% is, 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 is 20 million divided by 100 million, okay? So I'm just making the market grow, grow, grow large to get an approximation. So the ratio between informational benefits and markups equals the expansion that the platform generates in consumers' consideration sets times a constant, okay? So that's where we're using extreme value, extreme value theory. And for most distributions of interest, that constant is one. So we can approximate the optimal cap as being the convenience benefit plus the expansion in consumers' consideration sets produced by the platform times the markup. Okay, so that, that's an arguably easier to use formula. Okay, this is an approximation. It has, uh, it, it has a good performance in small samples. For instance, if the distribution of match values is extreme value. Uh, so, so, so here is just an illustration with OTAs, okay? So, so, so with online travel agencies. So most empirical sources, they estimate that hotel markups are in the range between 20 and 30%, okay? So the convenience benefit, we're going to, to assume that it's commensurate to, to rates of uh, online payment gateways, like, like as PayPal, 2%, okay? So if you just apply this formula, you get this graph here, where in the x-axis you have the potential demands of consumers when the platform is not there, and in the y-axis you have the fee as a proportion of the retail price. Okay? So if, if, if the potential demands of consumers are very small, the cap is irrelevant, okay? So, so, so the, the cap is not gonna bind, uh, it's inconsequential. If on the other hand, in the other extreme, the informational benefits new, consumers know everything, then the cap is just a convenience benefit, 2%. The cap is gonna be 20%, for instance, if consumers, the counterfactual, uh, uh, um, uh, the, in the counterfactual profile, consumers, uh, uh, the firm's potential demands are basically 50% of the market. In this case, if, if, if the platform doubles the consideration sets of consumers, then uh, in this scenario that I just described, the optimal cap is 20%, which is precisely the average fee of booking.com, okay? So the claim here is that uh, uh, the average fee of booking.com is well for neutral. If booking.com at least uh, exactly doubles the consideration sets of consumers relative to its easiest alternative, which would be Google, for instance, okay? So if, if booking.com less than doubles the consumer's consideration sets, then uh, regulation would bind and, 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 and the, optimal, the, the, the optimal cap would be less than 20%. Okay, so, so that, that, that's the kind of illustration that we can make. This is just, this is just illustrative, right? There is a, 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 there is a challenge of actually measuring by how much uh, these platforms expand consideration sets relative to the best alternative. And that's what uh, gives the, the, the optimal cap. Uh, that we can plug in the formula we just described, okay? So I, I'm out of time. So I, 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 so, so I just wanna mention one thing. If you put de facto, de facto, band price parity, uh, that would be outcome equivalent to capping the platform's commission at the convenience benefit that the platform generates. The reason is that consumers would always go to the, to the, to the, to the, to the channel offering lower retail prices. And if hotels, can, can discriminate according to the, to, the, to the retail channel, then the platform cannot, won't make any sales if it charges more than the convenience benefit generates because that would pass through to consumers. So, so banning, banning price parity is, is akin to, to capping commissions at B, but the optimal cap is B plus the informational benefits, okay? So all in all, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you ban price parity de facto, you are stripping the platform of the possibility of appropriating any informational benefits. In general, the platform is going to appropriate more than the informational benefits. Optimal regulation finds exactly the right middle ground. And, and uh, uh, in this paper, we try to, to make it operational by using this uh, uh, extreme value uh, approximation, which works pretty decently. Uh, uh, so, so the challenge, of course, is still to measure uh, the expansion on platforms consideration sets. And, and that's something that I think can, can be done with surveys or experiments, but, but then it's out of my turf. Yeah. So, so that, that's, that's where I stop. I'm sorry for screwing up the thing. 
No worries. Thank you, Renato. Um, so we'll open it up to, for questions. I guess from here on, people can, uh, instead of writing the questions in the chat, people can, um, uh, can raise their hand and I'll unmute them. So I will unmute uh, Oslem. Oslem, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renato, for this very clear presentation. So I wanted to ask this consideration sets that you find very important and crucial for the impact of this policy recommendations. Uh -huh. But at the beginning, you also motivated your work by saying that when you, you know, ban price parity clauses, those platforms react by uh, delisting some of their hotels or putting them on the second page is the same as kind of delisting them. Mm -hmm. So nobody checks those hotels. So in a sense, consideration sets are in practice endogenous. But in the model, you currently put them as exogenous. As far as I understood, you said that if I visit the platform, I see everybody, yeah. right? Yeah. So have you thought about this also? Because this is kind of very crucial for your recommendations, the recipes of regulatory interventions. No, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Kind of my, my take is that, and there is some, some empirical evidence corroborating that, my take is that is that price parity de facto applies. So 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 in, in equilibrium and, or, or in reality as we see it, uh, firms are firms are, are, are not delisted. You know there might be some phase of experimentation where they they you know they tried to to price discriminate and then they were downlisted and then okay they behave not to be not not to sabotage the business model again or they join the preferred the preferred partner program. So so in, in a sense. The, 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 the position that we take is that in equilibrium, price parity is respected and that, and that firms are not discriminated in equilibrium and that consumers, they seamlessly can use the, the search tools of these specialized platforms to learn whatever they have to learn, you know? But, uh, but that's not the question, I think. I think the question is in the model, when I go and I looked on the platform, I see everything and I pick yeah. the max of everything. And consumers cognitively can't do that. So they are going to look on the first page. And if the platform has sorted exactly according to their preferences, then they will see the max on the first page. But uh, this is not in the control of the consumer. So it seems like it's another element of, that's not in your model. Um, yeah, the, the way I think of that is that, I mean, uh, I, uh, when I talk about this counterfactual uh, consideration profile, I'm thinking of, you're not gonna use the specialized search engine, which might be booking.com, you're gonna use a general purpose one. So you're gonna have uh, uh, less of an easy time to find, to find what, what you have to, 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 to find, right? Because the search tools are not that precise. I, f I, I would guess booking.com or OTAs in general, they have uh, a, a, more, a, more, a more precise uh, more, more precise such tools, which allow consumers to actually find uh, the best that they can actually find. And uh, uh, if that's not the case, I, I, I mean, I, I, qualitatively, I, I don't think it would, if there's no discrimination inside booking.com, because under price parity, there's no reason to discriminate, then uh, uh, consumers would, would have larger consideration sets. Perhaps that doesn't include all the firms that exist, but they, they would certainly get larger consideration sets in comparison to, to, uh, to a counterfactual where booking.com is not operating in a given market. And, and that's, that's, that, that's what actually matters for the cap. Cool, uh, we have a question. So Hannah has a question. Uh, Hannah, I'm gonna um, actually go ahead. Yeah, I unmuted myself. So, uh, so I, I really, I really like the results. I like the results about the um, about uh, how are we getting how the platform is actually getting the market power and can extract additional surplus, and and everything else follows uh, in your analysis. So I'm trying to figure out what is a crucial assumption that is getting us this uh, difference in modeling that is getting us this result here. And I'm thinking that in most, uh, a lot of uh, uh, platform competition or platforms models, we assume that outside of the platform, there's just no matching. Uh, there is, if, if, we do not, uh, if, if we do not participate in the platform, we're not going to get uh, customers and it's either one platform or the other. Here there's this outside option that there is some information and some um, this demand set outside of the platform. And therefore, when uh, 
when uh, when the when the uh, when the platform shows up, there are those two forces that Yossi kind of identified. That uh, on one hand you can benefit from joining the platform, but you can lose if you're not joining the platform and others are joining the platform. So is this the uh, you know is this the crucial assumption here? Uh, so if you would if so would we get your results if we assume that outside of the platform either there is no platform or we do not join the platform? The uh, our demand set is zero. Uh. Because then, then I don't think we're going to get the result that the platform is going to price more than the informational value because then everything is informational value that platform provides and then there is no abuse of power and, and then, then I don't think we're going to get the same results about the, cap, the efficiency of cap regulation. Well, if, if, if when firms don't join the platform, they get, they, they, they get zero. Uh, then, then basically the platform can extract everything that firms would be would be obtaining, right? So, so, uh, um, <clears throat> um, I mean, uh, uh, so I, 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 then I have a difficulty to think about uh, uh, to, to think about welfare, right? Because these firms they make sales in the first place somehow, right? So, so, so that's that's a bit of my difficulty. So, so I think it's natural to assume that that firms have a potential demand in the absence of the platform, right? Well, I mean, this this would be driving a, a lot of arguments. Would be like they wouldn't get this demand if we, it wouldn't be for the platform. So it's justified that platform gets. They, 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 no, no, I, I understand what you're saying. So you, you're saying that the, the platform expands expands the market demand, right? So it, it, it's certainly introducing a lot of consumers that would not be on the market to the market, right? Uh, 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 so 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 firms have a, a demand expansion because of the platform. That's something that we have in the paper and we derive the optimal regulation when the platform is greatly expanding demand. Uh, uh, so that can be addressed. I didn't talk about it because I already screwed up not talking about it. So so if I were to talk about it, I, I, would, I would take more. Uh, but, but we can address uh, a platform expansion. But, but I completely agree with you that the externality among participants relies on the idea that firms have a potential demand that becomes more contestable because of the platform. So this assumption is crucial. Uh, uh, in general, other, other authors that were working on, 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 on similar topics, for, for example, in, in Julian Wright's paper, for instance, the, 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 the firms they have a captive consumers and the demand for captive consumers is more inelastic. So, 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 so that, that's why, that, that's why there's not, the, the showroom is limited because you, you still want to, 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 to milk your, your captive consumers. So, so there, there are many different ways of modeling what's going on. And, uh, but, but the point that I wanted to take home is that, uh, um, is that in general, there's no, there, there's no reason to expect that a banning price parity or upholding price parity is going to lead to to a to a to a welfare maximizing outcome. You know, uh, either because if you introduce market power on captive consumers, uh, the you know the platform will have even even a, a higher leeway to set high conditions. If there's no market power whatsoever, banning price parity will 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 set a very a much lower cap. So so we see room for regulation precisely because there's no reason to expect. That, uh, that either laissez-faire or banning price part will lead to efficiency. So, so, so we need to directly address informational benefits and try to cap commissions this way. And speaking of Julian, right, I think you have a question from Julian. So um, I'll go ahead, Julian. Yeah, um, yeah, I disagree with the last point. Certainly, um, we also got externalities um, to the outside, outside the platform. I think they're basically coming from the price parity uh, restriction, the, the contract, mm -hmm. and you know the fact that fees will be higher, and that um, that the al the alternative that sort of raises the cost of using the alternative, and that can come about in different models in different ways. The point I wanted to make was, I think, and sort of going back to the original motivation, alternative to regulating the commissions. Um, which is obviously to ban price parity clauses. But then you say, well, banning price parity clauses doesn't really work because um, probably the main reason the platforms have control to steer consumers away from those sellers that are encouraging consumers to showroom, right? So 
that suggests an alternative to regulating commissions is to ban price parity clauses and to stop the steering, right? Like, I think that's certainly a regulation that authorities are looking at now, which is going beyond just banning price parity and actually looking at the algorithms that they're using to steer consumers away from sellers that are undercutting, you know, on cheaper channels. Uh -huh. So I think that's, that's possibly an alternative you need to at least sort of acknowledge or address. I see, I see, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. If you can, price, if you can ban price parity and, and actually uh, make sure that there's no discrimination going on, then, then uh, e, 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 yeah, uh, this regulation might be more effective. But, but, uh, but, but, but in this case, uh, 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 the, the, you know, the platforms will be capped by the convenience benefit or whatever other benefits they're generating, but not the informational ones, you know? So, so sure. that's, that's the, the yeah, that, not that's, to say it's the, not to say it's the optimal thing to do, but it's definitely another instrument that absolutely the yeah, yeah. can use. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kind of our claim here is that uh, uh, perhaps capping commissions is a more is a more direct way, uh, uh, and and uh, yeah, and, and, and if you, if you compute things right, you're gonna you're gonna get close to what you wanna get, whereas if you if you de facto bend price part, you might overshoot. You know? Sure. I was alluding to your paper just to say that uh, 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 you know. Under different modeling assumptions, you, you, I think you still have some. You still have, uh, 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 you still have externalities across firms, of course. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But you, you, you might, yeah. There's no reason to expect that you're going to get to the to the right outcome by banning them. So, so that's that's. Yeah. that's all right. So we're out of time. So this will. I'm going to stop the recording here. So this marks the end of the official talk. Of course, people that want to stay and ask more questions, we can still stay for uh, for uh, you know another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but I'll stop the recording here. So for anyone that needs to leave, well, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Renato. Thank you. I'll definitely stay.